Jerusalem and tarry until they be endued with power from on high with the Holy Spirit. So we found last week that some people, you know, they are taught against the Holy Ghost. Not so against the Holy Ghost but against the evidence of the Holy Ghost, which is the tongue. So we're going to cover that this morning, hopefully, with the help of our Heavenly Father. And in uh, Acts chapter 2, <coughs> in chapter 1, I'll just kind of, the church was set up in, in chapter 1. When Judas, uh, when Judas messed up and betrayed Christ and he was uh, the son of perdition, then they had to choose someone else to take his office. So that's what chapter 1 is about. And, and uh, uh, they were going into uh, Jerusalem to be endued with power from on high. So in chapter 20, and verse 26, it said that they gave forth their lots, and the lot fell upon Matthias, and he was numbered with 11 apostles. <coughs> so he was the 12th disciple then. So chapter 2. Thank you, Father. When the day of Pentecost, when the day of light was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. And that they were all with one accord in one place that's so significant. When you come into a body, like we came in here this morning, into this building, we came for one purpose, and that was to worship the Lord and to hear more about the Lord and to be taught. This is how we grow. If we're not taught, we don't grow. You know, little little uh, little Jay says, I mean, he's just growing great guns because we talk to him in adult language. I mean, he repeats, I, I thank God we're not a cussing family. Because he'd be one of the cussingest babies you've ever seen. But he repeats everything. He repeats everything that he hears. And you know, when, when he's getting into something, I'll give him this action. No, stop. And I mean, it's just about like that on that diaper. That's all I can bring myself to do. I mean, it's so cute. But he'll, now he's got to wear when I'm going after him because he's getting in my china cabinet. First thing he does is grab his tiny and say, No, stop. No. <laughs> and I doubt if he can even feel it. I told him, Just got to. I can't bring myself to hit him any harder. And she said, I know, Mom. It's okay. And I said, well, not really. But, you know, don't learn anything from it. But it'll have just girl. <laughs> I can't do it. But anyway, they were with one accord in one place. Gary, we're in Acts chapter 2, honey. Because this is what Jesus told them to do, is to go into Jerusalem and tarry. That means to wait. You know, we're such an instant people. We eat instant potatoes. I don't I don't like those things. Unless somebody else tricks me. And if they do, that's okay. As long as I don't know it, I'll just eat the fire out of them. But I can never make mine taste like that. So I just do the real thing. But we're such an instant body of people that everything's got to be done yesterday. But they were waiting. They were in Jerusalem. And they had come expecting. You know, when we come to church on Sunday morning, we should come expecting. It's not just a time of gathering. This is an important time in each one of our lives. I mean, we're growing in Christ from today. I'm growing. Brother Bud's growing. Hopefully you're growing. If we're doing our job, you're growing. You understand what I mean? If we're doing our job and 
seeking the Father and asking Him what He wants, then you're growing. And then you go out and you teach others. And all you have to do is just say, are you a Christian? You know, Jesus is coming back and we need to make ourselves ready. You don't have to, now let's go, it's us here, you know. That's the preacher's job. No, I'm not just kidding. But all it takes is a little witness. Just, just a small one, just a little witness. And if their heart and ear is tuned in to receive, then give them more. So if we're doing our job, that's what you'll do. But don't just depend on us all the time. So on the, when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled all the house where they were sitting. Let me tell you what happened to me one time, and you probably think, this is mine, more things happen to you. Well, you know, when you got a call on your life, God's going to prepare you, mm -hmm. one way or the other. He's going to do with you, if you'll allow Him to, what He wants to do. I was sound asleep. <laughs> sleep it again. I didn't <coughs> sleep, God. But it was like a tornado. You know how your mind, if you hear a sound, your mind can picture it? It was just like something with, with, well, Lynette was just a little baby. I'm not even sure she was born yet. But it was like, in my mind, I could pick, it woke me up. It was going, <sighs> up over my bed, up over me. Well, I, it woke me up, it was so loud. And I said, Jesus. And I went back to sleep. So this is the sound that came into their room, only probably it was louder. And so there came a sound from where? From heaven. As a as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled all the house where they were sitting. How many of you ever been like in a prayer meeting or here at church sometimes it happens? But it's like the presence of the Lord is so strong. I've heard people, I've even said it myself, boy, the presence of the Lord is so strong this morning you could have cut it with a knife. <laughs> Not really, but you know that's one way of expressing how strong the presence of the Lord is. Well, I know what I felt that night in my sleep. And not many days henceforth, I did receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Brother Ben already gave that testimony. And there, there appeared unto them cloven tongues. I woke up about 3 o'clock in the morning thinking, cloven tongues. And I've read that for 40-something years and never looked up the word cloven. You know, it's so important just to get you a good Bible dictionary or uh, a concordance or uh, a theosaurus and just look up words and it may, means more to you when you look up those words. Cloven <coughs> means in the Greek a tongue that was cloven that is parting asunder. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Well, let me back up. And there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as of fire, and it set upon each one of them. Now, <coughs> my study book said that it came down as one, it's like a lap of fire, like a tongue, lap of fire, but it, that was for the corporate body, like we're a corporate body here this morning. This church is a corporate. We had it incorporated. Isn't that the right word? We had it, we're a corporate body. So this church will always belong to the church unless you all get together and Brother Bud and I get together and we decide to sell it for another purpose and build another. You understand, we're a corporate body. So this tongue came 
this lap of fire came down in one, and that was for the corporate body. And then it divided and went and sat on top of each, each one of the disciples or the, all the people that were there. It was 120 people, I, I think, was there. And that was for the, for the individual. And they were all filled. When you pour water into a jar and you pour it to the top, you filled it, haven't you? And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Now, some say you don't have to speak in tongues to be filled with the Holy Ghost. But th there are examples, and the Bible says they were filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Well, now when you come to that part, you can, then it goes on down, and they said, well, we hear people, them talking in our language. They were, were a bunch of people had gathered by that time, and they were from different parts of the country around there, and they heard them all speaking in their language. That's true. The Bible says it. I believe it. Whatever it says in here, I believe it, and it's for me. But there's another tongue as well, and it's your, your language, your prayer language. Because see, when you pray, God knows your thoughts. He knows the very intents of your heart. And when you pray, God knows. And when you pray out loud, the enemy knows. Like Daniel, he was hindered for, his prayer was hindered for like 21 days. God said, I heard you the first time you prayed, but I was, the devil, I'm just talking in Southeast Missouri talk, hindered you receiving the answer. So that's what happens to us sometimes. And, and another example is when you don't know how to pray for a certain something. There's something comes up and you think, I mean, it's in here. And you think, I don't even know how to pray. The Spirit knows how to pray. <clears throat> yes. So that's why the Bible teaches us to pray in the Spirit. Now, it's your own language. I can speak in my own language because the Spirit, the Holy Spirit dwells in me. So in my God-given heavenly language, I can speak in my language any time because it's my language. No one else has a language, a heavenly language, like mine. But then there are times that my language is interpreted or I give out a message in tongues and the interpretation, I should be follow up with the interpretation because otherwise it doesn't benefit you anything for me to stand up here all day and go, he called out all of my shovel, glory of all of my father. That don't benefit you one thing except you think, well, this is not really on the roll this morning. <laughs> but see, when I say, and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost, now, I don't know if that's what I said, so I, mean, I was just giving you an illustration. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. The Spirit within inside you knows how to pray. God has always intended for His church to be powerful and to walk in the authority that He died for to give back to us. <clears throat> or as a servant to love as Christ loved. We're all servants. We're, I mean, some people might puff themselves up and think they're Mr. and Mrs. Holy, but they're not. They're servants. If you're really walking as Christ wants you to walk, you're a servant. If Jesus Christ, the Son of God, can humble himself and wash the feet of the disciples, who am I not to be able <coughs> or willing to wash your feet? That's an illustration. Or to do anything for you that I can possibly do. Because I don't think any of you would ask me to do something wrong. 
So he, we can walk in the authority as a servant to love as Christ loved us and be witnesses. And this is what the Holy Ghost is teaching. Is, that's why Jesus told us to be endued with power from on high and be witnesses. Sometimes it just really takes the Holy Ghost. You know what? And it's not just a one-time experience. Being filled with the Holy Ghost is a lifetime experience. It's like praise and worship. <coughs> praise and worship is not a song. Praise and worship is a way of life. Being filled with the Holy Ghost is not just a one-time experience. It's knowing who you are in Christ Jesus and it's a way of life to you. I'm going to tell you something. A Holy Ghost filled child of God is more potent than a hydrogen bomb. Woo! Glory! That just tickled my innards. Hallelujah! Woo! Glory to God! Man, did you just feel that sweet? Oh! And that's what happens to us when we receive the baptism of the Holy Ghost. We're endued with a power <coughs> from where? On high. A lot of people say, oh, that tongues business is of the devil. No, it's not. I would be scared to death to say that the tongues were of the devil are just a bunch of gibberish. And that's what a lot of ministers say. You know why? Because they're ignorant. They may go to seminaries from the time the sun comes up till Jesus comes, but if they say that the tongues is of the devil and a bunch of gibberish, then they're ignorant. That's pretty bold, but it's true. Mm -hmm. I only speak the truth. You'll never catch me in a lie. Because I don't lie. If you don't want to know the truth, don't ask me. <laughs> I get in more trouble by being truthful because I don't sugarcoat it. And to be the witness Christ really wants us to be, we must be equipped for the commission. Charlie, when you go to trim up a tree or cut down a tree, you have the equipment there already, don't you? You have it there. Amos came over to our house and fixed our doors for us. Bless his heart. I appreciated that so much. And then I, my bathroom got wet. And he put me in a new floor. He had the equipment that he needed. Tom, when he gets ready to go do something, you have the equipment that you need on hand. My Gary is equipped to handle every situation about a trucking business. He's equipped to do that. He's learned, and he's equipped himself. You understand what I'm talking about? Every person, if you go to make a pie or a cake, like I made a birthday cake one time and left the sugar out, well, hello, <laughs> Colin called that just right. I, it was decorated so beautiful. And Colin said, Mimi, this cake is so beautiful, but it tastes like... <laughs> and I said, really? And I took a bite and I said, you're right, it does taste like... It. So we have to be equipped to be able to do the job that God called us to do. And do it the best that we can do. Our equipping power is the Holy Spirit. The power is of God himself. The one that said, let there be light. Let there be birds. Let there be trees. Let there be water. Let there be firmament. Let there be stars in the sky and just swung out there. Knows every one of them by name. Hallelujah. I meet somebody sometimes I can't remember their name. has nothing to do with my age. <laughs> <laughs> We've got 
this thing going on to them. But he knows them. And this same spirit that raised Christ from the dead, when you receive him, dwells in you. Hallelujah. And what does he say? If that same spirit that raised Christ from the dead, if, there's that little two-letter word, if that same spirit, the pews belong to the church, but they're not saved. You understand what I'm talking about? You have to be equipped. You have to be filled. If that same spirit that raised Christ from the dead dwells in you, it shall quicken your mortal body. Now, I'm not talking about shouting and rolling in the floor. I've done them both and loved every second of it. But that's not the Holy Ghost. That's your reaction. It was my reaction to the Holy Ghost because he is so powerful. Sometimes you just don't know what to do. So you just start jumping up down. Hallelujah. But he dwells in you, church, if you have received him. It's a different. Now the disciples <coughs> were all God called and they were Christians. But being filled with the Holy Ghost is a whole new experience. It's a whole different, it's not new, it's a whole different experience of when you're saved. I don't care what anybody says. I've experienced him. I know what I'm talking about. If I had never eaten chocolate candy, then I could not say to you, Ooh, I don't like chocolate candy. Or that chocolate candy sure is good. I wouldn't even know what I was talking about. But trust me, I've eaten a lot of chocolate candy. You can tell the look at The supreme being of the universe, of his presence, of his spirit, God's very own spirit is to dwell within the heart and life of the believer. Acts 1 and 8, but you shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you and you shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem and all Judea and in Samaria and what? And unto the uttermost parts of the earth. America wasn't even discovered yet. Wasn't even thought about. So why did God put that in there? You understand what I'm talking about? He wants us to receive everything that he has to give to us because he's a good heavenly father. The tongue symbolizes the instrument of speaking and preaching and sharing the gospel. But it can be a deadly little weapon. You want to kill somebody, you can do it with this little thing. Or you can speak life to that person. I know people right here, that, not here this morning, but I know people that they speak death to each other all the time. You're losing your mind. No, you're losing your mind. Well, my mind's gone. No, well, mine's gone too. You see, you, you, you've, got, you've got cancer. No, I don't have cancer. Yes, you do. You have cancer. Be careful what we say to each other. The Holy Spirit is to be the burning power of the tongue of convicting, of the convicting message. So when we talk to a sinner, before you ever go talk to them, try to get by yourself for just a moment. And if you can't, then trust the Holy Ghost to do it for you. He'll bring things to your remembrance that you've forgotten. Scriptures. I can be on the radio and have this tablet in front of me and never even look at the thing. And the Holy Ghost just tch, 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 tch. pop scriptures into my mind and into my heart. Scriptures that I haven't even thought of for years. I was down here one time doing a uh, yard sale. 
And I, everybody had brought all kinds of stuff, and it was back there on the table, and I was the only one down here, and people was coming in, and people were going, and in just a time by myself was down here. And I stepped back, and a scripture that I had not thought of in years, <coughs> the Lord spoke it to me so fluently. And he said, My house is to be called a house of prayer. But, oh, you made it a house of merchandise. I'll tell you one thing I did within one minute second. I said, forgive me, Father, there will never be another yard sale inside this church. Not selling. Not doing it. This is not a merchandise house. You understand what I'm talking about? I hadn't thought of that in years. Well, I didn't know how it was going to go over by, with anybody else. I didn't really have the time to call a good news ladies meeting. So I just listened to the Holy Ghost. And from that time on, anybody that came in, I said, just take what you want. It's free. Just anything you want, just take it. It's free. We don't want his house to be a house. See, that's what the Holy Ghost did. He saw what was going on. And he endued me with, used the power that he had endued me with to correct me with what I was doing. Thank God he did. I knew I wouldn't get through with this this morning. But we'll, get, we'll take up here next, next week. So just be studying the first, the second chapter of Acts. And maybe next week we can kind of have it like an open forum. If you have a question you want to ask or a statement that you want to make, we'll, we'll do it. We can do that. Because it's important that we all receive the baptism of the Holy Ghost. If you have not received Him and you've accepted Christ into your life, you're just as much a Christian as you'll ever be. Please don't misunderstand. What Sister Bobby said, if we're not filled with the Holy Ghost, no, honey, I'm not saying that. Those disciples were so filled, full of God, you know, they loved the Lord. They were Christians. But it's different. It's different. And we'll take it up more next week. There's some things we don't know in life, there are some things we do know. We know it by faith. <coughs> I'll start, I'd like to read the whole chapter, I, I, I will not, but I, verse 6, we'll start there. Father, we thank you for all good and perfect gifts that come down from the Father of lights, and you, Lord, there is absolutely no shadow of turning. So, Lord, here we, we, we're humble people, we're needy people, and we ask you to manifest your love in a greater way than we've ever experienced before, not only through the beautiful music we've already experienced and, and love and the beautiful teaching we've absorbed in our spirits. I pray, Lord, next few moments as we share your your living word, there will be a tremendous effect in the harvest in the days to come. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Verse 6, John put it very clearly. I like John. I like his attitude. I like his writing. The Gospel of John is marvelous. First and second, third John is wonderful. Revelation is wonderful. He seemed to have a knowledge of God, didn't he? We are of God. How about that? He that knoweth God, heareth us. He that is not of God, heareth not us, hereby know we the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is of God. And everyone that loveth is born of God and knoweth God. Verse 8, he that loveth not, knoweth not God, or get this, God is love. Verse 9, and this was uh, demonstrated, or King James says, manifested the love of God toward us, because that God sent His only begotten Son into the world that we might live through Him. Over in the book of Romans, I won't go there, chapter 5, we find out that God sent His Son to die for us while we were sinners, while we were ungodly, while we were without strength. Isn't that wonderful? While we were enemies. That's a demonstration of God's love. And that's how we obey the great love commandment, love one another. 
It's not just in word, but in deed and in truth. We can do for others as God would, <coughs> what God do for us, but what they do for us, whether we feel like it or not. But let's move on here on this. I, I think it will bless your heart. I trust it will. So, we've already read this. This is a demonstration of the love of God that because God sent His only begotten Son. Remember that? John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that He, what he gave. Amen. Well, the greatest demonstration of the love of God is giving. And no, I'm not going to take another offering, so don't get excited. <laughs> giving. And another application of the love of God is forgiving. We'll talk about that as we go. In fact, there are many uh, applications of demonstration of the love of God. When we begin to look at it and understand it. So here is love, not that we love God, but that He loved us and sent His Son to, the, to be the propitiation for our sins. Beloved, God so loved us, we ought also to love one another. You say amen. Amen. <laughs> well, thank that's you. That's right. Yeah. I know I got you excited now. <coughs> thank you for one or two amen. No, oh, it's the word of God that's true. Yes, it is. And how does it play out in a man's life? I want to read something in the Gospel of John, the third epistle of John, just a couple of verses. He's writing to some of the well beloved Gaius, and whom I love in the truth. Verse 2 Beloved, I thought of this verse this morning. Uh, years ago, I was a coke salesman in this area, and uh, and one day I was called on it, a place I wouldn't go into all that. It's long gone. It should be, I think. <laughs> it's a dangerous place to go in the dark. But uh, I called on here in the daytime, and, and the uh, owner manager just looked at me for some reason. Here I was a heathen myself, pagan. He said, "You know, I'd like to be a Christian." No, he said, "I would love to be a Christian, like my mom and dad." But I just don't want to be broke. Every once in a while, that comes back to my memory. And you know, whether you agree with this or not, I think that the great image presented of Christianity, true Christianity, if you're broke, you're busted, disgusted, kind of living in a ditch, can't help nobody, can't even help yourself, that's real spirituality. Is that biblical, though? Is that biblical? Well, if it's not biblical, then let's all give everything we got away and live in a ditch. If you really want to go to heaven, but that's not scriptural. You might be broke. We might be as poor as Job's turkey sometimes. But that doesn't mean that's the end of all things. See, God is able to make all grace abound towards you that you may have a sufficiency in all things. That's what the Bible teaches us. We'll get to it in a moment. So this is what he said. Beloved, I wish above all things that thou mayest be destitute and be sick no, all your true. life no, and that you true. never prosper in any way, shape, that's or fashion. That's right. that's right. Jesus died for our sin. We know that. You know when we say, I'm saved, and you should say it often to yourself and no one else. Well, what are you saved from? Well, just a very short list. I'm saved from hell. Right. I'm saved from sin. Right. I'm saved from death. I'm saved from wrath to come. Right. And it goes on from there. The word saved, salvation, is a powerful uh, root word from the Greek, which means delivered, <coughs> set free, made free, prosperous, whole, spirit, soul, and body. Jesus gave himself his spirit for us, his soul for us, and his body for us. He really did. And I believe that the devil hates one thing, and that is the, the demonstration of love, because it plays out in giving and forgiving others. And forgiving yourself. Amen. This is a glorious gospel. That's why it's called a glorious gospel. It's called the gospel of Christ. It's called the gospel of God. What's gospel mean? That means good news. And I am going to reflect on just a few years back in my life, in a long time now, in my life. I didn't go to church to find some new religion or some new, the right way of doing it. What I really was looking for was life. Amen. And I'm looking for peace, which I had enough. I had enough. I was in a constant turmoil. And I, I began to hear the glorious gospel. A little here, a little there. I'd go home and read it. And 
I'm, I'm glad I read the scripture. Unfortunately, I started in Genesis 1. Not that it was necessarily bad, but I, by the time I had finished that, I was a legalist, bar none. You see, because all I had read was the old covenant, and thou shalt not, 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 and good, and good law, good laws, we need laws. But I begin to read some strange things in the New Covenant. Hard to understand. I wasn't Jewish by no means, but yet in my mentality, I was. You see, I really thought, okay, if you're going to be a Christian, you've got to believe in Jesus. All right, step one, that's right. And you've got to do the very best you can, nothing wrong with that. And you've got to keep the rules. All the rules. Of the law. Every one of them. I did read where you didn't have to be circumcised. I said, thank you, James. <laughs> you know, Richard Wick. Because I was 30 years old. I didn't really want to have <laughs> these experience. But, you know, I, if I, if that's what it took to get life, then okay, woo, let's go for it. But give me a whole lot of that joy juice when they hit me to knock you out. And you know, and help you out. But uh, the old timers just did it with a flint knife. Guess all they put a stick between your teeth. I wanted that. <laughs> Didn't want to find out. But I began to find out some strange ideas to me in the Bible that God is not against me. That God is not interested in my destitution and my lack of. And I, I think we all have been hampered by I don't have what it takes to do. But we forget what we hear sometimes, being a do with power from on high is part of it. Because we are by the Spirit when we receive it and begin to press our claim and do our share of some things, not to get saved, but to you know enhance our salvation and make it work. What did God tell Moses? I hope I'm sending you down to Egypt. <laughs> he fled there four years ago. And I want you to go tell Pharaoh, let my people go. And, you know, you've heard, you, you've ever read, I hope you have, you, he had a lot of excuses. But you remember one thing God said, what have you got in your hand? What was it? A stick. You know, it's a <coughs> stick. Well, throw it on the ground. It became a serpent. But not just a serpent, a serpent that destroyed and devoured the, the magician's serpents. And when it was time to cross the Red Sea, hold it up and become a Red Sea partner. Hmm? When they were losing the battles at times in the wilderness, he held up the rod of God and they won. He spoke the rock with that rod and it watered a multitude of people, plus cattle. What do we say? Live as much when God is in it. So I'm beginning to slowly perceive when I give God my little gift, it's more than enough. Because God's more than enough. Talk about Moses. Remember, Sister Bonnie, he said, uh, who shall I say uh, sent me? And what was God's marvelous response? I am. I am. Amen. You better, huh? <laughs> he was saying, Moses, I am so big, you can't even put it all down in the book. Right. The world can't contain it all. I am that I am. I am all you need. <coughs> I am what you need. I am who you need. And I am your God. I am with you. You obey me. I'll show you some things. And I look back over the past years, my stumbling and stumbling and fretting and stood. There have been times of God's great grace in my life. I was amazed, amazed, amazed at what He's done for us. And still am. But I love this. Beloved, I wish above all things. Church, I pray this for you. Amen. I wish above all things, every one of you. Yeah. Those who are not even here this morning because they're sick or because of that, <coughs> that you prosper. That means push through, break out, overcome, right. succeed. Amen. Oh, glory to God. Amen. Whatever you need to deliver from, that it happen in Jesus' Amen. name. Amen. And be in hell. Amen. Amen. That's plain English. Be well. Amen. And that's so. That means your innermost being prosper. Instead of being bowed, be, beat down, bowed down, Oh, I done this. I done that. I'm poor. I'm poor. I'm not fit. I'm not worthy. He has made us fit. The blood of Christ has made us fit. That means.
and he's able to do it. I know you got to have your mind, your heart renewed to what God's Word says instead of what we think, what we feel, what we've heard, what we've seen, what God says. And when it happens, I believe that endowment of power, which also means ability, we begin to take off in a new measure. Amen. Well, let's just follow this thought along here. God is a good God. And how do I know that? Well, I'm going to go over 2 Corinthians chapter 8 for a moment. I hardly ever preach out here for some reason. You know why? Because it's talking about money. <laughs> That's it. I hope you all know, right? I'm not one of these guys that run under trying to get everybody's pocketbook and rip you off. That's ridiculous. You should never, ever, ever give because somebody pushed you to do it. That's right. I'm serious about it. Even the Bible will back you. Back you. <laughs> well, we're second print. I'll start over with this. I got Galatians. I'm going to touch on it for just a moment. In just a moment, we won't take much time with this because I want this. Be fresh in your hearts and your minds. Praise the Lord. When we first opened, that fellow brought a picture of church, tears in his eye. He just had a, a holy ghost chill, he said. Had goosebumps. Showed me a picture of a little dilapidated building. <coughs> he said, that's what our church is going to look like, Brother Bud, in the future. And I smiled. I said, well, I sincerely hope not. Kind of ticked him off for a second. <coughs> Oh, I've been out here in the parking lot. You may have been caught in the blessedness of this. Guy wants some money. And I turned down many times before Lord leaves me otherwise. And just here's a wonderful, wonderful response. That's what I hate about churches. Look at all these new cars out here. I would like to say, but I don't bother. Well, if they have a new car, so they you could work for it or deep in debt for it. Pay payments on it. Like we all do. <laughs> Not every point. Right? Yeah. I think God people all have a nice vehicle if they want it. They don't want it. That's fine. I don't fuss with that. I walk. I can walk again. If I have to. I'm going to be as a father of Paul in my faith in Christ. I know how to be, you know, suffer and want, or I know how to be a man. I'm here. Amen. God has the answer. Yes, he does. Okay. So, so this is this is kind of the story of what was going on. Let me read you one in a second. Uh, second Corinthians chapter eight, over in chapter nine, just a couple of verses. Talk about the same thing, giving. Now, what they were giving for was a special offering for the poor saints in Jerusalem. The poor saints. I thought they had plenty. Well, at one time they did. Persecution and all kinds of things that happened. And you know, when people leave an area like crazy like they did, you know, your base kind of runs low. Your funds can run low. We've seen it here many times. We've had plenty. That time we've had very little. But I always say, you know, if the offering was, it hadn't been that long ago, I had offered $84. And we had to have several pretty good size bills, a $450 gas bill. Well, you know what I always say? Father, I thank you for providing our needs according to your mission and glory by Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. If that's what came in, then that's sufficient. That's right. And more than one time, I have received, not every time, once in a while, I got a call from this called a big gas bill. Young man had just gotten his income tax back. He said, I want to do something for the church to pay a gas bill. <laughs> I said, well, it so happens we have a dandy. <laughs> it's too much. Just give what you can. It pays it off. Well, glory. I said, bless me. <laughs> now I'm going to bless you. I'm going to tell you if we were they're not here today. So what is this? Verse 7. Uh, Every man according as he purposes in his heart. Never give out of pressure. I've been something beats anybody who witnessed to that. Mm -hmm. We're 45 minutes an hour, hammer, hammer, hammer. Sometimes people give a couple dollars and try to shut them up. That is not. <coughs> not even fun. I, in fact, I, I don't even know that's happening. I don't believe in it at all. There's nothing but discouragement. 
and just adds fuel to the fire, or, you know, all you have to money. Listen, friend, the giving I'm talking about is far more than just money. First of all, the greatest offering is to give ourselves to the Lord. That's biblical. And then, as we purpose in our heart and have the ability to give with to others, to help. Tithe, offerings, however you want to break it down. That is, in your heart to do it, and do it in your heart. And God loves a cheerful giver. He says to him here, Every man, of course, he works in his heart, so let him give, not grudgingly or of necessity. I tell you folks, if you don't give me that million bucks this morning, I'm going to have to quit. <laughs> I just say, well, but goodbye. <laughs> don't mean to be ugly, but I've heard ministers say that. My knees are not, not met here. You people are going to beat my knees. That's wrong, as far as I can see. Scripture as well. But uh, well, I'm not in hurry again. We're not going to take another offering. Praise God, y'all are generous. You give. He's purposing your heart. Well, go to God. That's sufficient. Some of you been throwing money in that little jar back there. I almost got trouble over that. I took it without asking. It. Took it to the bank, of course, and then I gave him the money. Forty bucks in that thing. So I learned a lesson there. Leave it alone. <laughs> And the women after you, man, whew, you were in big trouble. Poor son of a bitch. I meant, well, it didn't turn out so hot, but anyway. <laughs> <laughs> but I think it forgave me. I hope. Your wife's the only one got on to you, that Oh, okay. <laughs> well, between you and another young lady, I said, okay, okay. But she's more supportive than my spouse was. <laughs> <Anyway. laughs> so let him give, not grudgingly or necessity, for God loveth a cheerful giver. And watch this. And God is able to make all grace abound toward you. I like that. That ye always have an all sufficiency for all, or in all things, may abound to every good work. And he based it on the scripture. As it is written, he had dispersed the law, he gives it to the poor. His righteousness remaineth forever. Amen. It'll come up a memorial for you, if not a blessing here in this life. I believe it comes home now. Mm -hmm. But how about a giving? of ourselves to others. How about giving kindness to someone? How about giving mercy to someone? How about speaking well to someone? To encourage them, not flatter them. God loves them, no matter how aggravating they are, or I am sometimes. Amen. It's true. And what a beautiful thing for a child of God to bless someone with a, a good word, a phone call, a visit at the time, a card, something simple. It doesn't have to be something elaborate. I had remember what I said. Young man, he had seven kids. I thought, bless his heart. He came and said, Brother Bud, the Lord put on my heart to give you a, a gift. I said, oh, it's all right. <laughs> you need yourself, but I didn't say that. He gave me a next time. And I thought, yeah, what a horrible time. Because <laughs> I didn't like that time anyway. And that's my first thought. But I smiled and said, well, well, God bless you. I believe God did. And later, probably won't be a suit. <laughs> the time kind of complimented. So, <laughs> it was a. Those are the days when it's the 70s. And anybody can remember those days. Oh, my God. You know, about a green belt and a yellow suit and purple tie. It's just it's a wild time. Fancy pass reward and polyester. We was having a cookout at the church. One of the brothers got too close to the campfire and just shriveled his pants on his legs. He couldn't get out of it. I said, man, I think we need to go back to the coveralls. This is awful. This is awful. How are we going? I'm sorry. Just get back to the church. <laughs> We don't want to laugh in church. My pastor used to say, you know, it's so funny. When I first started at church, this was way back now. He said, everybody out in the parking lot laughing and talking as soon as they hit the door is all. <laughs> <laughs> we had a deacon board set on a bench. It was along this side of the church. And that's the north end. That side. And I sat in the front row one day watching the brothers. I love them all. One of the guys. You know about sour looking. <laughs> I told my buddy, I said, how'd you like to be in a court of law and not be the judges? <laughs> I 
should have said that, but he, he had to leave the church for that. <laughs> you know, I've been scared. So here we go. Where are we at? Let's just get back to this. So, chapter 8, the second prison, we will conclude with this. <laughs> and the thing was, this need had been great, and other churches had already been given. And first of all, this is read about eight, <coughs> eight, eight verses here. Moreover, brethren, we do you to wit, and be witness of the grace of God bestowed on, on the churches of Macedonia. How that in a great trial of affliction, the abundance of their joy, you mean you have joy where you got a whole lot? Yeah. We're rich in a lot of ways, you know. And their deep poverty abound unto the riches of their liberality. You mean poor people can give? <laughs> they might ever get out of debt, probably we should. But listen, they had a heart to give. <coughs> Did you ever hear the saying, it's not Bible, I don't think, not even close, I don't get it, maybe I shouldn't quote it, but anyway, many hands make light work. What's that mean? If everyone does what they can, it takes a burden off of others. Isn't that right? That's right. Please don't sit around and wait. We don't hear. There's some rich person, some, who is this, uh, Forbes magazine had the richest men in the world. Wait till they just get saved and said, we're going to send you some money. Uh, let's don't wait on that, okay? I pray they get saved. Wait till they get saved. Let me come over. Why don't you pray for me? I know, okay, why? What's up? He said, well, my wife and I talked about it and we decided we're going to start giving tithes if we get the lottery. <coughs> this is a long time ago, obviously. The lottery was $70,000, which is a fortune. Still would be big. He said, that you know that would be 7000 for you. I said, well, I need for the church. I said, I'm not going to pray for you to do that, brother. If you give tithes now, if you give all the money on I said, I don't think you wouldn't end either. Any man. You know, if you love somebody, sometimes you'll do the hard thing. Amen. Okay, so their their great joy, deep poverty, and all of them together wound up with a great bounty to take to the four saints of Jerusalem. For to their power, I bear record. <coughs> Yea, and beyond their power, they were willing of themselves, bringing us with much entreaty, that we would receive the gift and take upon us the fellowship of the ministry to the saints, meaning simply, please take this to the saints of Jerusalem for us. And this they did, not as we hoped, but first gave their own selves to the Lord. This clue number one, to be blessed. Gave their own selves to the Lord and unto us by the will of God. Insomuch that we desire Titus, that as he had begun, so he would now finish in you the same grace also. Me, said, you guys have been talking about this for a year, now it's time to do it. Prove your, prove your love. Sincerity of it. So this was not a sudden up, overnight thing. Now what does love do? Don't forget that. Love gives and love forgives. Aren't you glad he's forgiven us? Amen. And over somewhere I've got a note someplace if I can find it real quick. Yeah. Ephesians uh, 4.32 And be ye kind one to another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God, for Christ's sake, hath forgiven you. So all you do when you forgive someone, you're blessing them, you're releasing yourself. Were they ever accepted or not, or even like you or not, you forgive them. And they have no power over you anymore. Hmm. I tell you, if somebody has hurt you, they can, they can still have power over you. That's right. Up here. <laughs> In your, your heart. Well, where's old so and so? I've seen you talking. That dirty rat. You don't believe, you wouldn't believe it then. I mean, he jerked the rug out of me at the worst possible time, caused me so much hurt. <laughs> I hope he gets a. I hope he gets a. I hope he gets it. <laughs> I'd like to be 
he wanted to give it to me. So when you think of this sincerely, Christians can talk like this too. When we really get it straight, oh, wait a minute, God has forgiven me. He commanded me to love others, and love does no harm, love does no ill, love forgives. Okay, I got it. I forgive you. Uh, years ago, I read a couple months ago, long ago, I hadn't seen it in years, they were kind of gray now, <laughs> like we're not. And the story was, that there was a movie way now, I pray to God that nobody would even get a hint about us before. I don't think anyone here would know it. I'm sure you know. But maybe God will be in here. Well, the situation is Christian. And, you know, Christian gets so busy working for Jesus. But sometimes we get together to work together. Huh? It's Jesus first. Family second. Church third. And he spent a lot of time away. He spent a lot of time going away. And one night something happened in the wife committed over. She was devastated. Couldn't believe she died. Did it. Told her husband. And that's when the war started. The big time. And then of course the conversation, I mean he was very indignant. Angry, okay, got it. Fear rate, to say the least. Got a divorce, yeah. And, uh, but he still, well, really, let's see, you know. And he kept saying, How could she do this to me? It sounded like I had a picture, what a true vision, of a man at a tall ivory tower, looking down, pointing a long finger. How could this? How could you do this to me? And in the course of conversation, I don't know what led that direction, but found out he was a habitual viewer of pornography. <laughs> now, neither one is good, okay, to get straight. <laughs> but I had the opportunity to say, excuse me, you are committing adultery in your heart by looking on this mess. And he got... <laughs> I thought they were going to hit me. But love me the hard things. I mean, wait a minute. What happened wasn't right. But what you tell me, she isn't sick about it, repented of it, and you're all indignant, and all you've been doing is viewing pornography. What did Jesus say? He said, oh, I don't know. I said, well, let's read it. And I read it to him. He really looked so funny. Looks. <clears throat> I can see he was confused. I said, you think on this before we go any further, friend. What you do is your own business. Yeah, you got a biblical out here. You want it. But if you're a beer of you're a beer of